Wales, as it may sound, but I have a deep love for North and West Wales with many holidays there, and I've climbed Snowdon and Cadder Idris many times. Some of you will know those. Well, in Leicester, Crusader classes were very strong, and my two elder sisters attended on Sunday afternoons. And uh, I remember being four and too young to go to the boys' Crusader class. So by special dispensation, for a year, my sisters were allowed to take me to the girls' class. I have a photograph of 23 females and myself in the middle at the front. <laughs> when nearly eight, a humble teacher called John Fielding at the Boys' Crusader class told us about the Passover lamb, the blood of Jesus, the lamb of God, and the lamb's book of life over a period of months. One Sunday, I went home and told my mother I wanted my name writing in the Lamb's Book of Life. She helped me to receive the Lord Jesus as Saviour and Lord. As far as I know, that teacher, John Fielding, never knew he'd been instrumental in my conversion. And uh, reminds me that heaven will have a lot of pleasant surprises. Who knows who we might have influenced to come to the Lord and and we never knew it. Yeah, we're in. It was farewell to Leicester when I went to University College London to study economics and statistics. In the third year, I was interviewed by English Electric Computers and thus started a career in computing. I married a girl from Leeds, Margaret, and we settled here. Our nearest church met, worshipped in a Methodist hut on half an acre of land. It was already going independent <clears throat> for very good reasons. And we finally bought the property from the Methodist church after a struggle of nine years where we were allowed to attend, etc. The books were frozen, as it were, but it wasn't ours yet. Well, we've been at the same church, which is Tinsel Free Church, in a new building, uh, but in the same house ever since. And I was pastor here from uh, 1990 to 2012. Now, with regard to a thought for you this morning, I've been studying John 15, 9 to 16. And if you wish, you might wish to read that with me. But in special regard to the progression of God's love, the progression of God's love, I call it. Let's read the passage, John 15, 9 to 16. <clears throat> As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Great, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. <clears throat> May the Lord bless the reading of his word. The progression of God's love. There are many themes, of course, in that passage, but we're looking at the origin and the outworking of God's love. God is love, of course. And the origin of that love lies in the Trinity and right back in eternity. You see, our passage begins, as the Father loved me. Verse 9 indicates deepest possible love 
and not just in the current life our Lord was leading on earth, but from the beginning. Father and Son were united in love, and of course with the Holy Spirit, though not specifically mentioned here, the Father and Son were united in love before the world was made. That's a wonderful thing. John 17, 24, Jesus says in prayer to his Father, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. And we get a hint of it in the identical statement spoken by the Father at our Lord's baptism and transfiguration. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And there's something very mysterious and wonderful about this love, because our understanding of biblical love, rightly so, involves self-sacrifice. It's the whole essence of our Lord's death and his, his love for us. So the way we express love is, frankly, self-sacrifice. But this love in eternity, in the perfect place of heaven, is a mystery because there's no sin there. And it's hard to think of self-sacrifice in the perfect place of heaven. So there's a real mystery and depth in the Father's love for the Son and vice versa. In a sense, I guess it's a family, family love, but not human family, a divine person's family. One of our hymns goes, oh, perfect love, all human thought transcending. And then also in verse 9, as the Father loved me, I also loved you. And that's the progression. The progression of Christ's love to his disciples and thus to us. What a wonderful thing it is. It's the same sort of love. That's the great thing. Same sort of love as from eternity, as in the same way. And this time the thought of self-sacrifice is central. Our Lord loved and cared for his disciples during our Lord's ministry and then died for them and for us. And we're just left saying, what kind of love is this? The progression of God's love continues, of course, in our love for the Lord Jesus. Not mentioned in this passage, but in 1 John 4, 19, the same author, the Apostle John, we love him because he first loved us, not just a cold cause and effect. The Holy Spirit moves in us, in our heart, to see the wonder of God's love for us through the cross of Jesus. So our love in response is a thankful, it's a praising love, it's a response to his love. And then it doesn't stop there. It then goes in verse 12 to the commandment of Jesus that you love me, that sorry, that you love one another as I have loved you. Again, the progression of God's love. So to sum up what I've said, as the father loved the son from eternity, so the son loved his disciples and us today, and we return that love. And thirdly, as so the disciples are to love each other, you and me. Verse 17 repeats the instruction. These things I command you, that you love one another. And somehow, in our weakness, in our sinfulness, it's the same sort of godly love has begun with the Godhead. Remarkable how any essence of God's love can come, can come through us. And that's the miracle of God's grace in giving us new life in Christ Jesus. Now, when we meet again in our local church, perhaps physically or on the computer tomorrow, you might think it might be difficult I hope it's not the case, but it might be difficult to love somebody who seems to oppose you uh, or dislike you uh, unjustly. 
and it's easy to get uh, feelings of response that are not too nice. So the lesson is here, surely, we're to rise above it, to rise above it, not retaliate. Look to the source of real love, which clearly is the Father and the Son, rooted in eternity, but expressed even now through us. And I, I guess, certainly speaking to myself, the more we can do this to rise above tensions and to return love is, past, is part of personal revival. That's how we'd like to be every time. And I just trust that that love remains in us and that it really does get shared with everybody we meet, including our enemies. But here in the passage, we're talking about each other. I would certainly love that revival that does such love a lot better in me. <clears throat> well, I will pray first, then you, as you feel led, uh, do follow on after me. And Willie, I understand, will close in prayer at half past ten. <clears throat>